Hey guys, so here we go. I'm going to try to give you a little preview of the FRQ and how we should approach it. Um, I'm using the 2018 AP Psychology FRQ and I'm just going to give us a bit of a intro to it. We're going to answer the question on here together and then we'll use this as a springboard to more practice in the future. So the first kind of thing that I like to do is um, start with this little mnemonic device, TDAS, okay? So the T stands for term, and this is a pretty simple one. We just write the term and underline it. Um, this just makes it easier for the person who's grading it to know what you're talking about so they can give you a point for it. It also allows you just to keep uh, organized in case you accidentally skip one or that you, uh, you know, might lose your spot. You'll know, okay, this is what I've already done. So we write the term and underline it. So for instance, uh, over here, if you look at part B, I'll go over the first part, it's a little bit more tricky, but part B, it says de-individuation. Um, I would write de-individuation, underline de-individuation, and then go from there, okay? The second thing that we should do after we've uh, written the term and underlined it is define the term as best we can. Now, if you just define the term on the FRQs, uh, you're not gonna get full credit uh, most of the time. So, the, but if we do define the term and um, we do the next step, which is apply, most often we're going to get the term correct. And so we always want to define the term kind of just to help us get uh, what we know down on paper and to help give us some direction and maybe fill in any holes that we might have uh, missed on the application part. Um, the definition alone, again, is not suffice to earn you credit, but it's it's an important part, I believe, to kind of just help us uh, along. The next part, the A, is the actually the most important, and that's apply. Term, define, apply. So this is where we're going to apply the term. So in our case, where I just underlined it, de-individuation. We're going to apply de-individuation. We're going to apply it to the scenario. So in part B, here's the scenario, okay? So we're going to define the individuation, and then we're going to apply it to this survey of risky behavior by high school students. So we're going to say something like um, <clears throat> uh, high school students might have exhibited the individuation because, and then apply the term to that. And then the S, if I'm spelling this right, synonyms, synonyms, is that right? I'm sorry if it's wrong. I'm going to have to re-record this whole thing if that's wrong. Synonyms. Nims? Hope so. Um, we want to use synonyms as much as possible. Um, don't use the key here is don't use the term in your definition and application, um, or at least in your definition. So you're not going to say de-individuation is when people feel de-individualized or um, something like that. Use a synonym, and that lets the grader know that you understand what the term is because you're able to give a similar term. Um, that means a similar thing. Okay, so this is kind of the outline. This is the general um, pattern that we use. Term, define, apply, and then synonyms. So TDAS with synonyms, TDAS. Um, and if we follow this, we're going to get, we're going to do well. Second thing to remember. If, if you're looking through this and you're like, oh crud, I don't remember some of these terms. I don't know what some of it is. Here's the good news. The good news is uh, neither do most of the other students who are taking this exam. They also don't remember some of the terms. They might not remember the same ones as you. They might remember different ones. Their teacher might have gone over different things. And so especially um, important for you to realize is that don't get caught up on not knowing something. Spend your time focusing on what you do know because what you do know is where you're going to get a point. There's no half points. There's no partial credit. It's either you get a full point on it or you get zero. And so don't worry about the stuff you don't know. Focus on what you do know. In fact, the average score for the FRQs um, is anywhere in the two to three out of seven range. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points possible on this question. So there's seven points possible. I don't remember the, you can look it up on the AP Central website, but I'm guessing it's, it's like 2.5 or 2.6 or 2.7 out of 7 that was the average score on this. And so that should be reassuring to you that 
you don't have to get everything correct in order to do really well on the, this exam. You, you just need to do really well on the ones that you do know, and you're going you're gonna to pass with flying colors. All right, so let's read through this. And uh, I'm going to erase this, so if you don't have it written down, write it down. Um, but we're going to read through the scenario over here, and then we're going to start answering it over here um, together. Okay? So part A. <clears throat> Some of the survey... Okay, number two. A survey was conducted to determine the state of physical and psychological health of high school students. And then we have two part, three parts to this. So here's part A. We just answered them in the, in the order that they come to help keep us organized. Part A, some of the survey questions related to student stress levels and student absences due to illness. The data on these variables are displayed below. So on the Y axis, we have a um, number of absences due to illness. And on the X axis, we have the stress level. Um, if you guys remember back to correlations, right? what do we have here? This is called a scatter plot. Remember that? We have a scatter plot, a bunch of different data points. So this is like student A, student B, student C, student D, and they're all here. And then this line in the middle is called the line of best fit. Neither of those um, you really need to know um, for the for your answers to get full credit, but that's just pointing out what, what, we, what we see here. And you'll also remember when we talked about correlations, we had positive and negative. So in this case, before I go any, any farther, before I even read any farther, I'm going to know that, hey, look, number of absences as the number of absences goes up, right, as we move this way the amount of stress also increases, right? So stress is also going up. As we get the number of absences go up, the stress is also going up. And so we have two variables that go in the same direction. We call that a positive correlation, right? So we know this is a positive correlation, right? Before I've even read any of the rest of the things, I'm, I'm just writing down information that I know, okay? Um, so let's, let's move on. What is the most appropriate conclusion that can be drawn based on the figure above? Well, I think we just did that. When you um, figure out whether something's positive or negative and a correlation, um, that's, that's essentially a very important point of the data that we're, we're seeing here. So um, that's something to keep in mind. So let's look at the second one. Explain how the data depicted in the graph are consistent with the exhaustion, <coughs> exhaustion stage excuse me, of the general adaptation syndrome. And then finally, a researcher wants to conduct another study using the same variables, but wants to, to set it up in an experiment. Explain one reason that an institutional review board might not approve this new study. Okay, so we got an IRB here, the institutional review board for this one. Um, we've got the exhaustion stage of general adaptation syndrome over here that we need to know about and most appropriate conclusions, okay? So I'm gonna get off the pen and I'm gonna start typing now. Um, what we what we have going. So if you remember back, we started out with TDA, okay? So in the AP Psychology FRQ, we don't need an introduction, we don't need anything fancy, we just jump directly into what's going on. So you could say, uh, this one doesn't really have a term, right? We talked about TDA, term, define, apply. There's not really a term, but the most, mm, that's weird. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna pause this because the little instrument that I use to write with, let me see actually if I can take that, won't let me press space bar, there we go. The most appropriate conclusion would be, and so I'm just, for the sake of keeping things um, consistent, I might underline the most appropriate conclusion. So let's get this off of bold. The most appropriate conclusion would be, and what do we say here? Okay, most appropriate conclusion is when I'm, I'm looking at that data and I'm saying, hey, as the number of absences go up due to illness, the amount of stress goes up, would be that there is a positive correlation between the number of absences due to illness and the stress level of a student okay and quite honestly that's all you need that's a full point right there I have uh, there's no definition again in this but I am applying it so this I, I start out with TDA and then the very first one we don't use that really because there's not really a term we're interpreting a graph um, but uh, interpreting a graph seems to be more and more popular on the FRQs for psychology so we need to be able to interpret graphs 
All right, so the most appropriate conclusion would be that there is a positive correlation between the number of absences due to illness and the stress level of the student. Um, if you see anything else, you can add that there, but I'm just gonna stop with that. We don't need to add fluff. You're not gonna get bonus points if you answer in three paragraphs that. You, once you answer it, you're done. And so I'm gonna move on to the next one. Um, the next bullet point would be explain how the data depicted in the graph are consistent with the exhaustion stage, exhaustion stage, geez, of the general adaptation syndrome. So um, if you remember, we have to figure out what the general uh, adaptation syndrome is. And then we have to remember what the exhaustion stage is. So uh, general adaptation syndrome was that um, stage where we have our baseline of what our normal sort of homeostasis level of our body is. When we have a high stress situation, it could be either acute or chronic. Acute really means it's, it's intense, it's short, it's for a short period of time like you're attacked by a bear, that would be acute. Chronic would be, that would be acute stress right there. Chronic would be you are um, in your last semester of college or high school, you have a job, you have to take care of some family members and you have a lot of stress. It's not, there's nothing really just sucking it to you all at once, but it's really just expanded. So that's what chronic is. We have chronic, like in uh, medicine, we have chronic pain or acute pain. Um, chronic pain might be your back's just always aching. Acute pain would be you just broke your arm and it's hurt all of a sudden. Um, so when we have a high stress situation, whether it's acute or chronic, um, initially you have a, it, it drops down a little bit and um, your homeostasis and your body's resistance drops down for a short bit while it kind of gets its bearings. And then what happens is, is it shoots up, right? It shoots up to um, resistance level. And that's what the second stage is called, resistance. And so it's resistance and everything's higher. Your testosterone or your um, adrenaline's higher, your heart rate's higher, everything, your defense mechanisms are all higher. And that stays like that until the stress is over. Um, or until you run out of, you just can't carry it on any longer. And then what happens is it drops off the, the cliff. It drops off the cliff. I don't know if you saw my hands on that. I can't see myself. But it drops off the cliff. And then you're, when you finish, you're lower than when you started. This is why a lot of times, and I've mentioned this in class before, when you go on vacation, a lot of times people get sick right when they go on vacation because normally leading up to a vacation, it might be a little bit more stressful because you're trying to prepare everything to go on a vacation, trying to make everything's good at work. Or if you're a student, usually before you go on vacation, you have finals, which are stressful. And so you might um, be facing this general adaptation syndrome. So anyhow, exhaustion phase is that third stage. So when you're exhausted, your body's defenses go down. Okay, so all of that to say, the exhaustion stage. And so again, I'm gonna underline that term. comma, which, which is the final stage of the general adaptation syndrome. I'm just going to abbreviate it for now, comma, and I'm going to define it, uh, says that your, your body's defenses are reduced, gee whiz, reduced when you can no longer maintain resistance or the stress or leaves, okay? Um, so there's my definition. So term, define, apply. In the data above, comma, students are ill more as, I'm sorry, students are stressed more as their illness um, takes more days away from class, right? And so you guys have all experienced this, you're away from school and then what happens? And your homework starts piling up, you miss lectures, you miss activities, you miss labs, and everything gets more stressful because you have to make up all that work as long as well as keep up with what's ahead of you. So you get more stressed. So the more days that you're out, the higher your stress level is going to be because you know, oh crap, I have two labs now I got to make up. I have to make up that test and that quiz for this class and all this and everything starts becoming uh, more stressful. Okay. And that's really all you're going to need for that. So we, we, 
have our term here. We defined it, and then we applied it to the situation. In, this, in the situation, we're talking about the data. All right. And then we move on. Uh, researcher wants to conduct another study using the same variables, but he wants to make an experiment. Explain how the IRB might not approve this. So remember, uh, whenever you do a research experiment, you have to have it approved by the IRB or the Institutional Review Board, which is basically an ethical um, gatekeeper uh, for any research at an educational institution. So ethics is the big thing here. So we're asking ourselves, uh, what might be ethically unappealing to doing this in an experiment? Well, uh, I would look right here. Stre oops, the stress level right there. Is it ethical to make students uh, more stressed, right? Because uh, prolonged periods of stress can lead to bad things down the line. So I would say that the IRB... Mm, the IRB, I might just, un again, this is another one where it's not really a term, but the IRB might not approve this study because it may be unethical to induce higher levels of stress than necessary. Um, to students and then I could probably end it there but I might just add if I'm like oh is that enough I might add one more sentence this of why that's unethical this may create long term um, this may create long term problems down the line and that would be it so again I term I kind of defined what unethical is about it and then I applied it uh, so those would be the first three uh, and then we're just going to go down and continue on with the rest. I think I might stop there because this video is already longer than I really wanted it to be. Um, part B, some of the survey questions related to risky behavior. The results indicate that 90% of high school students' risky behaviors were influenced by social factors. Explain how each of the following may contribute to an increase in risky behavior. So again, just to start this one out, I would put uh, D, individuation, individuation, and then again, underline it. There's my term, is, is when a person loses a sense of self or um, personal responsibility due to being in a large group, right? So there's my definition, which might not be the dictionary definition, but it's gonna be close enough. Okay, so term, define, and then apply it. Uh, what am I gonna apply it to? I'm gonna apply it to this uh, data that they're showing. The results indicate that 90% of high school students' risky behavior were influenced by social factors. Um, students may experience de-individuation when they are in large groups such as parties they and then I'm gonna that, that, if I just stopped it there I probably would not get the probably would not get the point for this because I kind of just said I kind of just explained again that they're in a large group but that doesn't tell me why um, they're expressing risk behaviors they might um, do stupid, in quotation mark, things when they are with a lot of other people and cause themselves harm. Okay, so again, I uh, apply this to the risky behavior, social influences, okay, or social factors. And then normative social influence, do the same thing. Normative social influence is, again, just jump right in. Underline normative social influence. Um, talk about what normative is when you uh, are influenced um, to not stick out so that you don't stick out like a sore thumb. Remember, we had normative social influence and informative social influence, I believe, was the other one. And... Um, 
we want to fit in with that one. That was the Ash conformity. That's conformity stuff. Ash conformity experiment. That was the, I don't want to, I'm going to choose the wrong answer because everybody else is picking the right answer. And we just move on from there. And so again, it, it's pretty simple. Just follow the formula, term, define, apply. Make sure you're paying a special attention to this. The graph, I'm, the graphs are, like I said, are becoming increasingly popular. So go online, on Google, type in, uh, in practice interpreting graphs and practice, practice, practice that. Practice identifying the independent and dependent variables. This one didn't have that, but that's always on there. Independent and dependent variables. Um, practice, <clears throat> rem or remind yourself what the y-axis means, what the x-axis means. Um, and you can go from there. All right, I believe that'll be it for now. I'll come back with some more practice in the future, but here's a good first start. Thank you.